Well, what in the world did I leave out? Good morning, good day, or good evening, whenever you happen to be listening. Each week on this podcast, we follow up our Sunday message and dig a little deeper into the passage that was just preached. My name is David Miller, and I'm the pastor of membership here at McGregor, and this is Beyond the Notes. This past Sunday, we looked at a passage in John chapter 6 where Jesus walks on the water and then begins to preach his infamous Bread of Life sermon. Uh, And he does so to a crowd that seemed like they were interested in him, and they were, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But both of these events, the walking on the water and the sermon, uh, came on the heels of Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. And we looked at that two Sundays ago. And our Beyond the Notes podcast is primarily designed for us to cover something that we typically don't have time to cover when we preach. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment, too. But I want to take a mo- moment just to encourage um, a group of people that make up a part of our audience on this podcast. And those th- that's those that, that teach the Bible, particularly those here at McGregor that teach the Bible. We have a lot of faithful life group teachers and other folks that are Bible teachers in our church. And I know that some of them re- listen to Beyond the Notes uh, on a regular basis. So if that's you, I don't want you to miss an application point of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's been helpful to me over the years. I preached my first sermon when I was 16 years old, and uh, early on, an older and wiser brother uh, in the ministry shared this with me, that our preparation for teaching and preaching is essentially five loaves and two fish. You can say what you want about the little boy who brought this happy meal, as Pastor Russell calls it, Um, but the one thing that we know about him is he was prepared He had something to offer that day when the opportunity arose, even though it didn't seem like much. And for me, sermon preparation is just like that. Uh, Everyone on the preaching team here at McGregor has a slightly different method of preparation. But for me, that preparation includes going over the passage a bunch of times initially just to marinate my mind in what the Word actually says praying for God to give me understanding, uh, breaking the passage down into small sections, and then seeing those in larger chunks, um, referencing commentaries and other Bible teachers, uh, writing the sermon out, revising it again and again, making applications along the way. And then one of the hardest parts for me is cutting, (laughs) Uh, figuring out what not to say. And um, and we have to do that and to um, make it fit into a workable time frame for our Sunday services. But that's just some of what I do on a typical preaching week for me. And as important as all that work actually is, uh, when Sunday morning comes, it's five loaves and two fishes at that point. It's what I've prepared. It's what I offer the Lord. And I have to depend upon Him to be the one to work the miracle. Um, And that miracle is where his people feast on his word. So if and when that happens, it's not because of my prep, it's all because of God's work. And I think it's important to remember that. As the sovereign Lord, he is the determinative factor in what happens in the faithful preaching and teaching of his word. So to any other Bible teacher that's out there, I do pray that that is an encouragement to you that our preparation is five loaves and two fishes. Lest we be prideful in our abilities, uh, it's His work that is happening. Or on the opposite end of that spectrum, lest we be discouraged by when our teaching and preaching doesn't go well. It's also His work that is happening. All we do is prepare to bring the five loaves and the two fish, and He does the miracle. Now, back to this past Sunday. Uh, There were a few things that I didn't cover directly in in John 6 in the passage. Uh, We walked through actually verses 16 through 29 uh, this last Lord's Day, verse by verse, and 
One of them that I left out is a statement that Jesus made to the crowd. The Bread of Life sermon actually begins in verse 25 with the crowd asking Jesus a question. And Jesus cuts right to the chase by revealing their selfish hearts in that moment because he knew their hearts. Uh, He knew they were following him to get more bread, not to get salvation. So beginning in verse 26, uh, here is Jesus's response to the crowd. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now, as we talked about this past Sunday, Jesus bounces them pretty good here um, because they're chasing him across the Sea of Galilee for bread, a temporary physical provision um, when what they need is the bread of life. They need Jesus himself, and, and Jesus is God's only provision for sinners to find eternal satisfaction. Uh, And so the phrase in this statement that I didn't talk about was at the very end of verse 27, for on him, God the Father has set his seal. What does Jesus mean that God the Father has set his seal on the Son of Man? I actually got a question about the Son of Man after one of the worship services Sunday. Why why does Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man? And, and, and the Son of Man is Jesus' favorite way in the Gospels to refer to himself. It's actually used 13 times in the book of John alone. And it in the Old Testament, Son of Man is a messianic title, if you will. It describes a human who has received divine authority. And so Son of Man runs side by side with the title Son of God. (laughs) So both of them together give a full picture of the incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation, that Jesus is fully God yet fully man. So when Jesus uses the title Son of Man in conjunction with the statement in verse 27, for on him God the Father has set his seal, I believe he's talking about authority, bottom line. In a manner of speaking, you could say that Jesus... Uh, that in sending Jesus, God the Father has authorized Jesus, the Son, to be the provision in how the Father saves sinners. Jesus is our mediator, and this mention of the Father's seal here is denoting that Jesus carries the Father's stamp of authority. Uh, A seal was then and still is today used to denote authority. In ancient times, a seal was made by taking an engraved object and pressing it into soft clay. We see this in the, in the Bible and other places. The lion's den that Daniel got thrown into was sealed with the king's signet ring uh, in Daniel 6. And Jesus' tomb in Matthew 27 was secured by sealing it, uh, sealing the stone in the same way. So even today... Um, it's interesting, when, when each of my boys, I have two boys, when each of those boys were born, my wife sent off a letter to the President of the United States about their birth, and he sent back a letter of congratulations. She wanted that as a memorabilia piece, but those letters of congratulations came back with an embossed seal of the presidency of the United States. Again, a seal denotes the weight of the authority that is behind it. And so when, when, when you think about the Father setting his seal on Jesus, think about the ministry of Jesus and what moment in the ministry of Jesus most clearly illustrates the Father's seal. Well, I believe that happened at Jesus' baptism. I want to read to you, if I can, just uh, briefly, Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 through 17. And I think this is when we see see what Jesus says in John 6 get illustrated. And it gets illustrated in Matthew 13 at the baptism of Jesus. Verse 13 says, um, Then Jesus came from Galilee to uh, to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have presented him saying, I needed to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, 
For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, he being John, consented to baptizing Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." Jesus makes a reference to the Father's setting a seal on the Son in John 6, 27. And I think when that happened, my best guess would be in Matthew 3 and uh, during the baptism of Jesus. Well, that wraps up our Beyond the Notes for this week. Thank you for joining us. If you haven't done so already, subscribe. It's easy to do. Just press the subscribe button and subscribe to our podcast and give us a review if you'd like to. We'd love to hear your feedback. We also have other podcasts too, beyond Beyond the Notes. So hop on over to McGregorPodcast.com and you can learn about all the different podcasts that we have and how to listen to them. Also share this with somebody today. That would be a blessing not only to them, but to us. And you never know how you might encourage somebody with one of these episodes. And if you want to read and be ready for next Sunday's sermon, we'll be continuing in John 6, picking up in verse 30 where we left off last Sunday and moving all the way through verse 51 as we really jump into the Bread of Life sermon by Jesus. So feel free by all means to read ahead. God bless.